Well, good morning, everyone, or good uh, afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we've got a fairly international audience from all over the world. Welcome to this very exciting uh, webinar. I'm uh, Mark from IS Global, and my co-chair is Belen from uh, RMIT uh, in Melbourne. Um, I will be chairing the first session. She will be doing the second uh, part of the session. Uh, I also would like to thank um, all our technical staff who are there at the moment. Um, Annie, Laura, Sasha, Aless, and Albert, who are behind the scenes making sure that we can run this um, seminar. And I also would like to thank all the organizations involved. Um, and uh, you can see them here on the screen. In particular, I would like to thank the Severo Ochoa uh, grants uh, because they supported this webinar financially. Next one, Laura. I also would like to um, <clears throat> draw attention to the Urban Transitions Conference that's taking place in uh, November in Sitges. Uh, we're hoping that it's all still going ahead and abstracts are due to uh, this week although we may have some extension. This particular webinar forms part of the, another webinar that we're gonna have around the time of the Urban Transitions Conference. Thank you, next one. So um, we have eight presentations, um, eight great presenters for this first block of the webinar. Remember there are two webinars, this one for, the, for us European time in the morning and there's one in the afternoon you will have to register for the afternoon one separately. So the morning's uh, webinar is in two blocks, um, two blocks of four speakers. Um, and the speakers will present uh, for about 13 to 15 minutes. And then there are questions and answers after that. Um, if you have any questions and answers, please use the chat to send your uh, question. And uh, we can ask the presenters. So, as you can see here, we've got four excellent presenters, Pat van Wey from Delft University, uh, Alex McMillan from University of Otago in, Otago in New Zealand, George Stordy from London, and Emily Colback from, oops, I can't see it at the moment, from Infrastructure Victoria. That. So we're just going around the world. And I would like to start straight away. Ah, we have also the second block, what you will see after the break. Audrey de Nazelle from Imperial College London, Maria Jose Rojo from Polis Network, Alexander Santa Creu from Safer Streets, from the International Transport Forum, and of course, our James Woodcock from uh, Cambridge University. So I would like to start with the first uh, presenter, Bat van Wey from Delft University who will give us uh, an, an overview, a framework uh, on how to assess health impacts of active transport. Bert, um, the screen is yours. Thank you, Mark. And thank you also for inviting me to give this lecture. I will now start sharing my screen. And now full screen. Yeah. So the title of my presentation is 
how to assess the health impacts of active transport. I work for Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. If you think about the health impacts of active transport, you have to realize that there are several clusters of impacts. First of all, walking and cycling are a form of exercise and exercise is healthy. You might have heard of the WHO uh, guidelines. We have to be active for about 150 minutes per week. So being active is healthy. On the other hand, uh, being active in transport can be risky. In most countries, the per kilometer risk factors for walking and cycling are higher than those for driving. Um, you cannot simply compare on that basis. People have argued that you better compare per hour and not per kilometer. And there is a lot of other reasons why it is risky to simply compare walking and cycling with driving uh, on a per kilometer risk factor basis. But anyway, you run risks while cycling or walking and those risks should be included in uh, the overall assessment of the health impact of active travel. Thirdly, the intake of pollution matters. Per hour, the intake is higher if you walk or cycle compared to, compared to when you drive a car or are uh, traveling by public transport. By the way, there are a few exceptions. I've seen studies looking at the health impacts of um, uh, the intake of small particulates traveling by metro. And in some metro stations, the uh, concentrations are extremely high. But if we compare on street travel, the intake of pollutants is higher while being uh, active, walking or cycling, than while driving. And finally, and very badly understood so far, it's the impact on well being. Uh, several studies show that we feel better uh, and we enjoy more traveling uh, in the form of walking or, or cycling compared to if we would travel by public transport or if we would drive. So assessing the health impacts of active, of active travel should include all these uh, relationships between active travel and those four uh, ways that it influences health. The most important slide that I want to show you is this causal diagram, a conceptual model. You will probably see that um, travel behavior influences physical activity, it influences the intake of pollutants, it influences accidents or incidents, and it influences well being. The four categories of implications that I just showed on the previous slide. What we see in many studies is that they simply look at factors that have an impact on active travel, walking or cycling, and they simply assume the more we cycle or walk, the better it is for health. If it were that simple, it would be nice because we could relatively easily assess the health implications of active travel. I argue it's way more complicated than that for several reasons. One of the reasons is that travel behavior can, influences, can influence other forms of being physically active, but we poorly understand. It could be that people substitute going to the gym, for example, by cycling. And if so, it could be that the net benefits of cycling are absent because people substitute equally important forms of being active. And then the net impact via physical activity would be absent. And it could be even then that you then have um, the negative impacts of more intake of pollutants, more incidents, and maybe some positive impacts on well-being. But it is not even guaranteed that the net impact on health will be positive at all. On the other hand, we also uh, know that some people, once their condition improves because of walking and cycling, might become more active in other ways. For example, because you walk 
and you cycle, your condition improves. And then at your office, you take the stairs and not the elevators. So uh, travel behavior could then have a positive impact on being physically active in other ways. Then another complication is that it is not necessarily so that being twice as active is twice as good for health. And there is what economists call the law of diminishing returns. If you are not active at all and you start becoming active for half an hour per day, the health gains are way higher than the health gains if you then go from half an hour to a full hour. So the impact of being active on health is a non-linear impact. This graph also shows that personal characteristics matter. It would be too simple to simply uh, study the impact of an intervention, let's say building cycle lanes on cycling levels or having better pavements or walking levels. It could be that some people um, are more uh, inclined to become active than others. And that could be related to, for example, age. Um, if you're very old, you might prefer not to cycle or walk at all because you feel very vulnerable or you're not even capable of doing so. So age, gender, income, uh, maybe even your household structure could have an impact on your travel behavior and next on the health impacts. But it is even more complicated. I go to the block a residential choice. We know that the environment in which we live influences uh, the extent to which we are uh, traveling by car, by public transport, by bike, or uh, the extent to which we walk. Densely built areas which, which mix land use categories like shops and schools and houses. Uh, in such environments, people become more active. They, they start walking more and they start cycling more. But it could be that some people choose a residential location because of their preferences for being active. Maybe some people uh, enjoy walking and cycling and then they move to a neighborhood where that neighborhood allows them to walk or cycle. But it could be that that same attitudes also have an impact on being active in other forms. So we, we labeled this effect um, residential self-selection. People move to areas where they want to live and where they are able to travel in the way they like to travel. So the impact of travel behavior on physical activity could be influenced by a residential choice phenomena. And it's even a little bit more complicated than what I conceptualize in this graph. And uh, the reason is that it could, for example, be that if you have very bad lungs, you would never move to a place close to a motorway because then the intake of pollutants is higher. So residential choice might also have an impact on the exposure to pollutants regardless of travel behavior. And that could also intervene in the overall impact of travel behavior on health. Uh, when I wrote this paper that is the origin of this graph, I did it with Dick Etema from Utrecht University. And Dick is an expert in the area of well-being. And we had a very nice debates with the reviewers what is the relationship between well-being and health? On the one hand, if you feel better, that in itself is good itself is good for health. But on the other end, if you're healthy, you feel better. So there is a relationship in both directions. And we so far quite poorly understood how this works. So my main message is, that a lot of studies lack rigor. They do not conceptualize all the effects via which travel behavior could influence health. And if we really want to know the relationships between travel behavior and health, we should move to a bit more complex conceptual models like this model. So I argue that the complex relationships so far are poorly understood, and I can imagine why. The reason is that it is quite difficult to study those relationships. 
you need loads of data. Um, so a very large sample, you need complex models like structural equation models. Uh, so I can imagine why many people did not do it, but it is the way forward, I think, at least for researchers, maybe for policymakers, um, it's uh, good to rely on such studies. They don't have to understand all the complex relationships. There are some good examples. Uh, Mark Neuhauser, for example, uh, wrote, uh, a, did a study that includes many of those relationships. And we have seen the study of Kreis et al. from 2016. So it is doable, but these are the exceptions. And I argue that it would be very useful if we would quantitatively try to understand this full scheme. Which then are the most important things that could go wrong? First of all, the interaction between active travel and other forms of phys physical activity definitely need to be included. I had a master's student who did this, and first indications are that there is a positive impact. If people start walking and cycling more, they also start becoming physically active in other areas. But it was a study from the Netherlands, and context could really have an impact on the outcome. So I do not claim the outcome to be a generic outcome. It might be necessarily to repeat such studies in other countries. Secondly, the combined health effects need to be studied, not only those of being physically active. For policy, it's important to know what the overall implications for health are, and not only those directly related to being physically active. So safety impacts the intake of pollutants and well-being should also be uh, included. And thirdly, uh, we should take care of self-selection effects, which people move to which places, and that could have an impact on the health in, uh, implications of being active via walking and cycling. So I argue that there are many challenges for research and policy. We need to understand the complex relationships. We need to estimate the combined effects quantitatively, the effects via the multiple routes. We need to understand the trade-offs between safety, exercise, and the intake of pollutants while cycling and probably also by walking, but I've seen more studies in the area of cycling than the area of walking, to understand what the net positive effect is of being more active because of walking and cycling. And a third challenge is the safety barrier is an important barrier for the implementation of cycling policies. A lot of policymakers are afraid of seeing more fatalities or injuries because people start cycling and they don't want to be responsible. And I've had many conversations with foreign groups who visited the Netherlands uh, and we talked about cycling and they said, we are so afraid of an increase in safety levels uh, and well, an increase in, in accident levels. And that's the reason why the alderman doesn't want to implement the policy. By the way, the studies that I have seen, all but one show that the positive impact of being active is by far more impact important than the negative impact of higher risk factors. So I think it would be wrong to not implement cycling policies because of the fear of accident if your aim is to overall increase health and uh, increase the expected life years of people. To make it a bit more complicated, there is more than health only. A policymaker also needs to include other aspects before making decisions on land use and the transport system. They also want to improve accessibility by different modes. They might want a form of equity in having access to destinations. They want to reduce social exclusion of some vulnerable groups. They might want to improve livability. They might want to reduce the cost for travelers or the cost for the government. Uh, I think that walking and cycling are very attractive options because it's a way out for the tension between accessibility on the one hand and livability on the other hand. Cycling and walking is really a good solution if you want to improve all those aspects. And I've now come to the end of my presentation uh, and I think there is time for some Q&A.
Excellent, many thanks, Bert. Uh, wonderful, what a uh, great, you give a good setting of the issues. Now, can I ask you, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers to implement more active transportation uh, infrastructure? I think we then should distinguish between walking infrastructure and cycling infrastructure. Walking infrastructure is quite common, but we have seen some barriers in the US where in suburbs people did not even plan pavements. But overall walking, uh, it's more the quality and the maintenance that is often the bottleneck and not the absence of any uh, infrastructure for walking. For cycling, I think the most important barrier that I have experienced so far in cities without a cycling tradition is the fear for accidents. It's, I think, the most important barrier, and that's the reason why people have visited the Netherlands to, to speak about this topic with me. Of course, another barrier is that if you don't have any tradition, uh, you should start from, some, uh, from somewhere. So if you did not have any good examples, it's difficult to convince others. So the first step is other, uh, often an important barrier. A next barrier that I've seen very frequently in densely built areas is that if you want to have a designated piece of asphalt for cyclists, uh, you can uh, expect protest from drivers, from car drivers, because you need to reallocate road space to cycling. And that is a barrier, um, but often an overlooked barrier, because people then think that they will face huge congestion levels. Often the crossings are the bottlenecks and not the intersections. So uh, reallocating road space to cycling often does not come at the cost of uh, travel time penalties for drivers. How do you re reduce the risk of accidents uh, for cyclists? What is the best way for reducing the risk, do you think? The best way to reduce cycling risks, risks is to uh, take care of good quality of infrastructure, um, to train and educate people how to cycle, and, and the best uh, recipe is time. We have seen that over time, the more people cycle, the lower the risk factors become. This is called the safety and numbers effect. It is probably because more cyclists get more experienced, more drivers get used to people cycling. The local municipalities might then improve the infrastructure because more people cycle. So over time, the risk factors de decrease, not proportionally, but substantially after the implementation of policies to improve cycling. For walking, the most important uh, thing to do is to decrease the speed of drivers. If we would go down from 50 kilometers per hour to 30 kilometers per hour, the, the probability that you survive is three times larger uh, if you're a cyclist or a, a, a pedestrian. And uh, the probability that you face an accident is also way lower. The reason is that almost half of the accidents are because of people crossing roads not properly. And if cars then drive 30, they can more easily avoid accidents compared to when they drive 50 kilometers per hour. So reducing the speed is the most important measure to improve safety for pedestrians. Thank you. So we also have the climate crisis. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about CO2 emissions and how we should include them in our uh, appraisal schemes for, for transport. I mean, how can active tra travel uh, contribute to the reduction in CO2 emissions? It is a very effective way to reduce uh, CO2 emissions because the CO2 emissions of walking and cycling are almost absent. Of course, producing a bike costs some energy, but is, that is really very small compared to uh, driving, the overall energy on a life cycle basis of driving. And we have to realize that people probably substitute one hour of driving by one hour of cycling. Uh, so if people would cycle for, let's say, 15 kilometers, it could be the substitute for driving 30 kilometers. People will also adapt the destinations where they go to. So walking and cycling are very good for uh, the reduction of CO2 emissions. And it could also be that the urban environment then becomes more attractive and less people drive, more cycle, and that effect has a, uh, an overall increasingly important 
impact on the reduction of CO2 emissions. And we can easily include these in the assessments like in cost benefit analysis or multi-criteria analysis. There are guidelines for how to do it. Uh, and I think we definitely should do it. And then we will see that scenarios that substitute travel from driving to walking and cycling have lower CO2 emissions. Thank you so much, but we have many more questions. Unfortunately, we need to move on to the next speaker. Um, People can actually still post questions to Bert and you will answer them written um, and they will be posted on, on, the, on the website. Uh, so if you have any more questions for Bert, particularly I think uh, coming from the Netherlands, he knows a lot about cycling and what to do about cycling. You're welcome to write more uh, questions and he will answer them uh, later on. Thanks so much Bert for your wonderful insights. Uh, now we're gonna move on to our second speaker and we're going all the way down under to uh, Alex McMillan, who will be talking about uh, mixed methods for achieving change in the community um, in the Te Aramayu Future Streets uh, initiative. I don't think I pronounced it well, but, <laughs> but <I> can, <laughs> you can tell, tell us a bit more about it, uh, Alex. Uh, the screen is yours. Thanks. I'm just um, working on my screen share. <clears throat> um, while you're looking at it, uh, can I tell everyone that this webinar this morning is different from the one this afternoon? So these are not the same presentations. There was a question about this. These are two separate sessions. And this afternoon, we've got more speakers from the US. You manage, Alex, with your screen. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, just one second. <laughs> I think I've got it now. Great. Can you see that? Marvellous. Good. Oh, greetings, everyone. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, so greetings from the other end of the world and from the bottom of the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, this isn't going to be a modelling talk. Um, it's, it's a talk about um, an intervention study that's combined with some with measurement and modeling. And I'm speaking on behalf of the very of the large and um, fantastic Tiaramua Future Streets team um, who are listed here on this slide. And so um, it's going to be a bit about measurement, but it's also about why would we want to measure um, except to achieve change. Um, in response to all the evidence about climate change and about health equity and transport. Uh, so it's a, as much about how we understand change and how we make it happen equitably and fairly on the ground and in policy. But on the measurement side, one of the ways of measuring active transport outcomes is by bringing together modeling with an intervention study, which is what Te Aramu Future Streets is. And we've relied quite heavily in the past in terms of interventions um, or getting close to interventions on natural experiments because intervention studies are so difficult to do. And um, hopefully you'll get a sense of how difficult this one has been to do. Um, and just to note that it is a really um, big partnership between research funders and transport policy makers and transport funders and um, the community who are involved, communities who are involved in this study um, and a range of different uh, research institutions and universities. So quite a complex um, partnership study. And just to provide a bit of context, there's a picture of New Zealand, in case you don't know what New Zealand is like, a very long, thin country. And this study is um, based in the little isthmus at the top of the North Island um, in Auckland. And New Zealand has um, a number of closely interlinked health equity crises um, with deep transport and health inequities, both by income and ethnicity. New Zealand's a colonized country with, um, with massive and ongoing effects of colonization on indigenous health and well-being for Māori peoples. 
And it's also a Pacific country with Pacific migration and a role um, in Pacific colonization that again has a huge influence on patterns of health and health inequities for Pacific people. So um, you can see those graphs there in notes to yourself, but the, the photograph is of our first um, community dialysis, which is um, a public private partnership based in the community where the study is set in Mangere in Auckland. And that's because Mangere has the highest rates of diabetes um, in the country and one of the highest rates in the world. And so we already had some really good evidence from modeling studies and other work that all of the people who are involved in this webinar are very familiar with and have been involved in developing that evidence base around the benefits for health and um, potentially health equity of um, investing in walking and cycling. Um, and we wanted to take a very strong equity focus to measure the integrated effects of retrofitting suburban streets um, in a low income, high Māori and Pacific community. And then to use our findings from the intervention study to model some more generalizable costs and benefits for what if we rolled out this intervention more widely in one city or in the whole country. But also we really wanted to demonstrate a process for how transport policy and transport investment could look different through participatory design by involving communities in redesigning their streets and their suburbs to have a demonstration project of what it might look like to take an equity lens on redesigning suburban streets and to influence institutional change in the institutions who are making the decisions about transport investments. Um, and Bert will really like this slide because the, <laughs> we, we base, we're basing our study on a couple of different kinds of, of complex causal theories, um, which are used for different purposes, but both are really important. Um, and they're based on our own previous work and that of others, many of them here on the webinar. So firstly, a logic model that helps everybody involved in this um, partnership study to understand the likely timing and linear relationships between different outcomes in the study, between the intervention and the different integrated outcomes that we've included in the study, so that people understand particularly the timeframes over which things might be expected to happen. Um, but as well as that, based on a system dynamics model. And Bert's causal model did have some feedback in it, I noticed. Um, and we know that there's a lot of feedback involved in complex systems, like the relationship between walking and cycling and well being. Um, and we need to understand that dynamic complexity so that we can help policymakers to understand how the interventions that we choose might, um, might work to ha have the uh, well-being outcomes that we want dynamically over time. The study itself um, is as close as we could get really to designing a community-based randomized control trial. Um, so it's a, a co-designed suburban street retrofit intervention. Um, in the setting of a controlled before and after study um, involving two, um, two suburbs in Māngere that were matched, um, matched by a, a range of different demographics, street layout and access to um, local neighbourhood amenities. Um, and it involves a whole range of different measures um, that are listed there in that table. Um, um, many of the measures that Bert talked about. So, and they're being measured in a range of different ways, including directly with um, speed and traffic volume counts and video data um, via a random um, resident survey that's both longitudinal and panel combined. Um, again, via direct measures of air quality, um, using routinely collected blood tests, especially for diabetes risk, and doing some modeling at the end for cost benefit analysis and greenhouse gas emission changes. Um, as, well as, some, as well as qualitative interviews and focus groups. So a range of different methods being used. 
And to develop the intervention, um, we, we uh, did, used a range of different techniques to gather information from communities with a, um, a strong focus on equity and a strong focus on building relationships with the indigenous tribes of the specific area that we were working in. And in the context of um, the treaty that binds the crown to the indigenous peoples in New Zealand, um, we needed to centralize and prioritize um, Māori well-being in the design of our intervention um, and help them help um, and support the expression of ancestral responsibilities to land and water even in the city. And we developed a shared set of objectives with the community for the infrastructure changes um, that weren't just about being able to get around on foot and by bike, but were also um, prioritized improving safety from crime and expressing cultural identity through placemaking. And so this is what the uh, intervention ended up looking like, some before and after photos of what uh, um, many of you around the webinar will think are incredibly wide streets with plenty of room for good um, cycling and walking infrastructure. But um, what was a very car dependent looking um, design of a suburb and some very um, what felt like unsafe and underused um, green spaces that could potentially be used as linear routes for um, accessing different parts of the suburb. Um, and so a mixture of kind of placemaking that was very culturally focused um, and replanting and bringing back biodiversity um, combined with quite hard transport infrastructure measures. And those two things came together in slightly um, uncomfortable ways at times with a very concrete kind of traditional transport infrastructure combined with um, really sort of cultural and artistic placemaking. And we're just starting to do many of the outcome measures and see the early results. And again, using a range of different techniques to, to um, analyze and measure those outcomes. So um, in, in very much in keeping with our logic model, beginning to see significant reductions in speed and changes in traffic volumes, particularly on the local residential streets, which was where we wanted most of the change to happen. And some of our video data starting to show um, real changes in the way that people are using the streets, as you can see from those photos on, on the right there, and significant improvements in perceptions of safety from crime and social connection, but interestingly, not yet on perceptions of traffic safety, which is interesting. And so we've only been able to do so far quite early follow-up measures. Um, and we were planning to do um, follow-up measures again right at this time, but um, that was stopped by COVID, obviously. And starting to see real benefits for people with disabilities. Um, and so really some novel insights for measurement, but also for change, that placemaking and transport need to happen together. Um, that the clarity of causal theory, as Bert said, was really has been really important for helping decision makers to understand the timing of change. Um, having a demonstration project that's left a physical legacy on the ground for people to see what an equity focused change could look like. Having strong and long term partnerships with change agents, including the community and decision makers and shifting cultural narratives about walking and cycling myths um, that, that um, Pacific people don't walk and cycle, for example, um, has been really a, a key part of what we've been doing. Measuring a wide range of outcomes that feel important for different groups. Um, and also this tension between generation of new evidence and actually making change happen on the ground in ways that we know from previous evidence is, is really important and urgent. And so we just have um, several waves further of measurement that we're hoping to get to do once COVID allows us to do that. Thank you, that was the end of what I wanted to say. And so hopefully plenty of time for questions. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, wonderful initiative, wonderful study. I mean, um, now one of the first questions is, you know, this is kind of well planned or whatever, but at the moment in the post-COVID uh, era, 
we see that there are many interventions taking place. How do you think we could evaluate these interventions? What would you recommend to people? Because this kind of evaluations are quite difficult. Uh, are there any things what you would recommend to do some quick assessments? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've done is to develop some measures um, like the speed and traffic volume, like the video measures and the survey measures. Um, we've developed a sort of suite of tools really that can be used to do evaluations of more tactical urbanism, I think. So um, these, these uh, methods that we've been developing can be picked up and used in a more rapid way and perhaps in a cheaper way than we've done so far. And where can people find them? Do you share your tools? Um, we're very happy to share our tools. Um, and we've got some publications at the end of my talk, I think, on the slides. I've got a, a list of publications and links as well, but I'm very happy for people to be in touch to, to use the Excellent. tools. Um, if you want, you can post them on the answer and question, or a question and answer uh, session, if you have a website or whatever, so people can see it. Uh, there is a website, and there, I hopefully there are people who are here from the Te Aramua Future Streets team, if someone wouldn't mind posting the website in the Q&A, that would be fab. Yeah, so and then there's another question here about shifting cultural narratives. Can you... Uh, give some examples for that? Yeah, so um, amongst decision makers and amongst um, amongst communities and the public, I, there are some really strongly held cultural myths about, especially in car dominated um, countries and cities that, um, that around cars and around people's connection, cultural connection to cars. And particularly we found amongst decision makers some assumptions, cultural assumptions about who cycles and who would cycle, who walks and who would walk. And, um, and we know from the evidence that these myths are really not true. And so being able to use um, studies like this, as well as routinely collected data to bust some of those myths has been really important. Excellent, thanks. Uh, a final question, it's, it's around equity. I mean, you uh, deal with some issues of equity. How do you put them into your cost-benefit analysis? <laughs> well, I mean, I would say that, that uh, equity is poorly dealt with in cost-benefit analyses, and it's one of the reasons that I would argue that cost-benefit analyses are a pretty broken way of measuring um, well-being outcomes of transport. Um, and they fit with the kind of political economy of, of transport and the way it works at the moment. But um, certainly there are two ways we can think about um, valuing, I guess, equity. One is to, as we have done, to focus on um, low income, um, structurally oppressed communities with your design of your um, changes and work out what works for those communities and make that best practice, make that general practice. Um, and then to measure those equity impacts. So do your measures by income and by ethnicity and then um, value those and potentially even monetize them. And then they can be put into cost benefit and traditional cost benefit analysis. But I would really argue that cost benefit analysis is a pretty broken tool. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we're gonna leave it with this. Uh, there are some questions and answers on the um, on the on the question and answer session. If you could answer some of them as well, unfortunately, <laughs> only limited. Okay, time. I'll have a go at that. And I'm sure there's and people are happy to argue more about the cost benefit tools and the assessments, uh, how broken it actually is. That I have yeah. thanks and good luck with your initiative. Thank so you. We're now we're going from down under to um, down up. <laughs> 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 yes, hello. To London, to Joe Story uh, for Transport for London, who will um, talk about measuring London's progress towards Vision Zero. Uh, yeah. We'd love to hear more about Vision Zero and how you're getting on with it, Joe. Fantastic, thank you. I think my presentation is going to come up now and we're going to run through it as I do. Next okay. slide. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll just get my... I, I'm Joe Story from Transport for London. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, measuring our progress towards delivering Vision Zero. You may hear some children in the background, so I'll just continue uh, in that case. So 
Um, next slide is um, just giving you really an outline really of our ambition in terms of achieving Fusion Zero by 2041. And I think within that sits a number of separate targets. Uh, the first one of those is an 80% uh, mode share target uh, by 2041, which is essentially saying that we are going to reduce the amount of, in particular, the amount of private car trips in London. Here we've got a target of 3 million uh, fewer uh, car, private car trips. So the, really the critical thing here is saying this is a public health crisis and it is our ethical duty really to uh, deliver much considerable improvements in safety in London. Uh, next slide. So, um, so first to do that really, uh, we've taken a target based approach and we have a set of targets kind of going forward to 2041. Um, so the next target upcoming is the 2022 target, which is a 65% reduction in the number of people killed or seriously injured um, against our um, previous baseline. And then we move to 2030 to a set of interim targets and finally um, to 2041. So we really think it's important to set this against an agenda, agenda of, of sensible targets as we progress forward to 2041. Next slide. Um, so um, just quickly having run through those, really a lot of this is in our Vision Zero action plan. Uh, which sets out a kind of near-term strategy and it's based on four pillars and I think we've heard some of that already this morning. Uh, the four pillars are safe speeds, safe streets, safe vehicles and safe behaviours. So and really critical the kind of wrapper around this is about post-collision learning and implementing criminal justice effectively so enforcement um, around this. You can find out more about that on the website. So next slide. So that was really the kind of quick introduction and I wanted to, conscious of time, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the data and some of the trends we're seeing in London, just to get, set a bit of context here really. And this first slide has a number of colours here that represent the different modes of travel. And these are the kind of proportions and numbers of people who've been killed or seriously injured by those modes of travel. Now, in this case, we want, might want to focus on the green bars, where the light green are pedestrians, the darker green are cyclists. Um, and you can see also the, the orange bar are car occupants. Now, over time, as we were across uh, you know, global cities, we've seen a, a reduction in car occupant casualties. Now in London, we've also seen reductions in pedestrian casualties. And you can see in that bar, a kind of steady number of people being killed or seriously injured a cyclist. Now this needs to be seen in the context, context of big increases in cycling. And then now with the key stat here on that, on that um, kind of black dotted line, is we're looking at 80% of uh, people being killed or seriously injured, either being cyclists, motorcyclists, or pedestrians in 2018. Next slide. So this kind of sets out that context in terms of some of the journeys that have traveled. On the left, you see the kind of severity. So we're going to the fatal uh, injuries down to the slight injuries. On the right is the share of journeys. And you can see how risk changes by those groups. So again, looking at those uh, green bars, you can see a very large green bar. Um, in, the, in the fatals uh, column there for pedestrians, despite a lower mode share. Again, um, in looking at the serious um, bar, you see quite a large uh, area there for cyclists, despite the fact there's only 2% mode share. So this is quite a simple way of just setting out some of that risk. Next slide. So we can do some more interesting things, which are look at looking at long-term trends here. Um, and this takes us up to 2018. We have more recent data, but we'll be publishing that shortly. Um, and this is a log scale, which some of you may enjoy. Um, and this takes us, um, compares risk between different modes. And you can see for motorcyclists, risk is, risk is roughly 80 times higher than for people traveling by car. Um, and we've seen, but we've seen gradual reductions in risk. So for cyclists, as we've seen more cycling in London and more dedicated cycling infrastructure, we've seen, you know, about a 45% reduction in risk, we think, uh, since 2012. Um, there are some near-term concerning trends, particularly in terms of risk for car occupants. I won't go into that today, but that's a specific, specific area of concern for us. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, looking at that risk and trends in risk, we really want to understand where is the harm coming from to other road users. So this graphic looks at each one of those road users and the harm it kind of is associated with to other road users. So it doesn't include where, say, a car occupant's been injured. It's about the other road users who were injured in that collision. So here on the left, you can see the majority are cars uh, in London. That reflects mode share largely, followed by goods vehicles and taxi and private hire vehicles, and then motorcyclists. So the next slide takes this a little bit, looks at this slightly differently. And what we do here is we normalize by the number of journeys that are being traveled. And you can see that that bar for motorcycling increases quite substantially, in particular, the risk presented to pedestrians uh, in terms of collisions involving motorcyclists. 
And we also have um, a taxi and private hire operation here in London, which appears to be related to elevated levels of risk, again, to vulnerable road users, partly associated, associated to the model of operation and particularly our, our black cabs, the kind of stop start model. So, so this, is, uh, this is kind of just top level evidence supporting that. And then we see other trends as well. We see that, that trend that we've, we have observed as we see more cycling, perhaps more conflict between cyclists and pedestrians as well. So next slide, please. So we can also look at the people uh, who are being injured and perhaps look, look at some of the top level demographics. And you can see here that uh, we've got um, people in uh, by age group here and, and also those bars again. So you can see the majority of people being killed or seriously injured in London are aged between about 20 and 39. And this partly reflects the population distribution in London, um, but also that black line then normalizes for that population. So you can see that risk is actually elevated amongst those age groups as well. So this is clearly a target area for us to understand behaviors and risk in this age group, particularly amongst motorcyclists, and I guess uh, with higher levels of cycling as well within that group. Now, as we move to the right in that chart, we see the, uh, the older age groups, particularly those 70 plus, the risk starts to elevate, particularly amongst pedestrians, related to you know, vulnerability to injury as well. So this is another way of looking at that data. Next slide. Now, um, I've kind of gone through those quite quickly and, then, and I'd just like to focus a little bit on this one. This is where we look at the contributive factors associated with collisions. So these are some of the causal factors we think might be associated with the collision. They are subjective in the view of the police officer or member of the public at the scene of the collision, but they do provide some evidence to suggest different types of behaviour. And we can aggregate those behaviours into behaviour types. So again, we see a similar pattern as the graphs we've seen earlier. Cars dominate. Motorcyclists coming out here, particularly with risky maneuvers and speeding, something we, we kind of observe on our streets. Again, cyclists' uh, perception of risky maneuvers and potentially, potentially some risky maneuvers in terms of compliance with um, traffic regulations, perhaps. So you can see some of these trends kind of coming through in this graph. Again, we do the similar method in the next chart. If you go to the next, next chart, please. And here we normalize by um, the number of journeys traveled in terms of those factors that have been assigned to that vehicle type. And you can see here again, motorcyclists coming out quite, quite clearly here in terms of a, as, as a proportion of the journeys traveled, the amount of uh, types of risky, risky activity they're undertaking, in particular risky maneuvers and speeding. So this kind of helps us look at both absolutes and risk and kind of target our interventions a little bit more effectively at different types of road users. Next slide, please. And we can also look at the types of conflicts that are occurring. Again, this is things we've already talked about. Uh, for pedestrians, we see it's often the vehicle going ahead with a pedestrian crossing, either on a formal crossing or away from a formal crossing. With cyclists, we see, and with motorcyclists, we see it's the vehicle turning right across the path of the cyclist or the motorcyclist. But also it's where the cyclist is um, uh, sometimes having to swerve to avoid a, a door opening. We see that coming out quite clearly in the data, and that's often associated with private hire and taxi operations in London. And on the right hand side, we see for, for motorcyclists, there's, a, there's an issue here in terms of other vehicles disobeying um, uh, junction controls, but also where the motorcyclist is performing a, a maneuver. And sometimes we've seen that in the recent uh, set of fatalities, particularly high speed maneuvers when they're overtaking or turning right. Next slide. So um, this is some more interesting, innovative work, I guess, that we've been doing. Um, to kind of pull together some of that some of that data in a slightly different way um, and what we've done here is on the left you can see the number of people killed or seriously injured and that's kind of mapped out by uh, the location and a, and a kind of cluster model and you can see that the majority of these collisions are clustered within central london um, and they kind of cluster along specific routes uh, into and out of central london as we might expect um, and and this is largely related to um, high levels of active travel within central London. So higher risk, higher, higher risk uh, exposure. But we also see clusters in some town centers as well. And on some routes where we see high, higher speeds. Um, on the, the map on the right, what we've done here is we've taken an estimation of, of risk. This is using an innovative uh, uh, novel method to kind of estimate risk across the network using a, a, a range of different factors and a kind of neural network approach. And you can see that it's almost a mirror image to some extent. You see risk is much, much lower in central London and then elevates as we, as we kind of go out of London into outer London where there is less um, active travel, 
Um, and also we see that risk is actually lower on those kind of protected networks or busy networks, probably where there also is less active travel because they're not such pleasant places for people to walk and cycle. So part of what we want to achieve here is understand and target interventions in relation to both absolute numbers and in relation to risk. And to do this, to kind of improve local communities, to understand the importance and the barriers of safety to people being active in outer London, and to try to make those places much more, much better places for people to walk and cycle. And this is part of our healthy streets um, agenda. We've got a, well, we hope to have a large amount of money to invest in this and be working heavily on um, trying to improve uh, a number of junctions across London and various other changes to try and improve um, those areas and, uh, and understand why those risks are there. So this is gonna form part of our new way of uh, measuring risk. So my, my last slide as Mark, as Mark appears um, is here. So, so I think as part of that, um, and I've gone through the data quite quickly today, and you, and you can look at these slides, is just to say we want to communicate some of this information, both to, to yourselves, but also to Londoners and people who live in the, in, in the city, and, and to make them aware, both in terms of some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the public health crisis we, we have, and, and the impact that this has on people's lives, but also in terms of what their neighbourhoods look like, and, and, and some of the challenges they might face in their, in their neighbourhoods, and the challenges, we, we, things we want to work with people to improve neighbourhoods. So on the left here, we've got a, a London collision map, if you just go back to that slide, which is actually live and you can uh, query uh, host of information about your local area. On the right, we're working on specific dashboards that link to live data that's now flowing through to us uh, from the police. And we want to be more transparent and open with that data to help make decision making. And that's really important at the moment, particularly with the uh, COVID-19 epidemic, that we really understand some of the trends that we're going to see as we come out of lockdown and how we manage some of those, some of those safety challenges. And that's last night from me. Many thanks, Joe. Absolutely amazing. You have so much data there that and so well analyzed. And um, I hope that it emissions go down as well. What do you find yeah. uh, so for what I see popping out of cyclists and mot uh, motor um, motorists? What, what do you find are the, the quickest way to reduce collisions? Um, if you would recommend to any other city, what would you do? What would you say it's a good investment to reducing it fairly quickly? Well, I mean, there's no kind of silver bullet here. I mean, and every method involves, uh, it has kind of has uh, benefits and disbenefits. And I think, you know, some of the things that we've been looking at are obviously speed, and we've talked about that. And that's about in, uh, reducing uh, traffic speeds in London because we, you know, we know particularly during free flow periods overnight and when traffic levels are lower, that speeds uh, increase substantially. And what we've seen during the during the COVID nineteen kind of lockdown period is because we've seen reductions in traffic, we've seen increases in speed. So once, so I think one of the traditional views was you simply reduce traffic and that will solve the problem. Actually, by reducing traffic, you can end up increasing speed. So we need to have a combined approach here where we're looking at uh, lots of different factors that relate to each other and understanding how they all interact. And actually the experience that we've had over the last two months has taught us a lot in terms of how we might implement that going forward. So I'd say, I'd say reducing the amount of motorized traffic where we can and where it's appropriate. And I think reducing traffic speed are probably the two of the big things, but also it's about behavior as well. And it's about making people understand that speeding is un uh, unacceptable and it does have uh, big impacts on people's lives. And, and part of that is about communicating with people and getting that message across. But it's also about actually enforcing this, making sure that we actually have the appropriate penalties and infrastructure in place to deal with that. And I guess finally, talking about infrastructure, it is about infrastructure, having safe infrastructure for people to walk and cycle and having space for people to walk. So particularly, uh, you know, outside of, of main um, uh, uh, public, public transport, uh, you know, hubs, so outside down tube stations, etc. So we need to think about that and about where we can release capacity for people to walk and cycling away from other road users. Yeah, there is a question here as well about having obstacles on, on cycling or walking infrastructure on, on paths uh, and the need to being that being removed because often what you see in many cities what we see is that the cycling infrastructure has been put in later for example and then there are all kind of obstacles or it's on the side of the road where you got holes and whatever um, how do you deal with that and what should uh, other cities do well, I think, uh, you know, if speaking from a personal capacity, uh, I know that cycling around London is a whole range of different cycling infrastructure that we have. And, and some of this is to do with how that cycling infrastructure has been implemented historically. 
and also about design standards, you know, setting a common standard for how we implement effective um, uh, uh, cycling infrastructure. And I think, you know, it, for those who've visited London and seen some of our more recent cycling infrastructure, I think that has been incredibly successful. We've seen some really record levels of cycling, particularly during this lockdown period, you know, over the, over the weekends, people really starting to use that, that cycling space. So I think that's really worked. But the challenge remains about uh, existing legacy infrastructure and I think one of the things that we find is that actually cyclists don't use that infrastructure. They will cycle on the road and that's a perfectly legal thing to do. Um, and, and it may be that some of that infrastructure is not really appropriate, but what we, what we have done is we've um, developed a cycling infrastructure database uh, in, at Transport for London. And we've kind of carried out an audit of cycling infrastructure across London. Of course, resources are limited, but what we need to do is target where we think the, the current demand is in cycling, but also what the future demand will be and make sure we've got the right infrastructure in those places. And the other thing that we've been working on is a scheme, a mini Holland scheme uh, for selected town centres, um, trying to recreate a bit of a Dutch uh, feel in, in, in London. I actually live in, in, in an area that's been subject to one of those schemes and it really has made a difference just in terms of modal filters and, and just in terms of uh, encouraging people to walk and cycle a little bit more. And I think when people see other people walking and cycling, they start to think, well, wait a second, I can do this as well. So it's, so, so it's a kind of hearts and minds thing as well as infrastructure. Um, do you see also an increase in e-bikes? And um, can you say a bit more about it? Yes, so I had that slide's not in this pack because we're about to publish uh, some data over the summer with the Department for Transport, but we have seen um, an uplift in collisions and casualties involving e-bikes, but also e-scooters as well. So just in terms of the absolute data, clearly there is greater utilization of those modes. Now, what, what that means in terms of risk and danger is another question, but clearly, you know, we want to encourage active travel. We also want to encourage sustainable travel and low emission travel. Um, and, and I know that central government are looking at currently, um, to, there's, there's a kind of legal aspect around this. So they're looking to legalize that uh, use of e-scooters. This does present, I think, uh, challenges for us going forward, but we also want to make sure that other people, everyone can cycle. So those people who are less able can cycle as well. So I think we'll be working, thinking about a strategy uh, around that over the coming months and years, I guess, as this moves into the mainstream. And I think, again, thinking about the current crisis, we have seen significant increases in bike sales, a lot of people moving to electric uh, uh, e-mobility. And I think that's something that's coming really to London and it's already in a lot of other cities. I was in Lisbon recently and it's, uh, it's there, it's everywhere. So, so it is coming and, uh, and I think we just need to plan and understand that uh, as TFL. Excellent, many thanks, Joe. We need to move on okay. that uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Um, as you know, it's all being recorded and it will be put on the web so you can actually um, view it another time. There are also questions from people that would like to have access to the slides. Uh, we'll put uh, emails of the speakers as well so you can write to them for the slides. Perhaps we even put them on the web after we talk to them. Um, but just to stay within the program, we're going to move on. We're going to move to um, Emily Goldback from Infrastructure Victoria. So we're going down under again. Um, see what's happening there. I mean, how it apparently compares to London, I think. But now we've got for the whole of Victoria. Um, Emily, the screen is yours. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to see you all. And um, thank you very much for having me today. I'm just having a bit of trouble getting my presentation started. Um, I just one second. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so my name is um, Emily Colbeck. I am a Principal um, Infrastructure Advisor at Infrastructure Victoria um, and we're based in Melbourne, Australia. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about four things. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of who we are and what we do. Um, I'm then going to start to talk a little bit about um, some of the transport network pressures um, that some of the pressures that our transport network is experiencing and also um, a, a bit of insights into what some of the opportunity is for um, active transport here in Victoria. Um, and then I'm going to give you a bit of a summary of what the potential of active transport um, in Victoria could do, can do. And then I'm going to give you a brief update on um, some of our upcoming strategy and research work. Um, so Infrastructure Victoria is an independent um, statutory authority um, that was just 
established in October 2015. Um, these statutory authorities have been um, uh, established in many jurisdictions around Australia. Um, and so we um, have three roles. We um, develop a 30 year strategy for Victoria. We provide um, independent advice um, to government on um, key projects as requested. And we undertake research to, pro um, to progress some areas of importance in infrastructure to really help to in inform um, and expand the infrastructure debate. In our first year, um, in 2016, we were very much focused on the development of the state's first 30 year infrastructure strategy. Um, in 2017, we provided advice to government on future port needs. And we have now, um, uh, we've also um, provided advice in um, on um, automated and zero emission vehicles in Victoria. Um, we're also taking um, research into the areas of managing transport demand. Um, the approach um, guiding our work is around independence um, and developing a strong evidence base, being consultative um, with the Victorian community and being transparent um, and publishing as much of our evidence base as we can. Um, so this uh, slide here, I guess, shows you where um, Victoria is um, and our main focus, which is certainly probably my main focus at the moment, um, is working on our refresh of our 30 year strategy. Um, uh, so we're currently working quite hard on that um, and we're all working remotely like probably many agencies are around the world um, uh, and uh, so many authorities are around the world. Um, and the strategy is going to focus on four key areas. Planning for a changing world, um, strengthening Victoria's regional areas, um, enhancing our legacy infrastructure and building strategically to manage growth. Um, so we, when we come to a decision about what interventions we recommend, we use this framework and our framework is essentially has three steps. Um, can we get the most out of three, I guess, key elements, um, not so much steps. Can we get the most out of assets by managing demand? For example, in 2016, um, we recommended that government introduce a comprehensive and fair transport pricing um, regime to manage demand on the transport network. And we have um, recently released a report on this, which is available on our website if anyone is interested. The next question we ask is, what changes can we make to get more from our existing assets for example, could we increase the density? Um, in, so Melbourne is a very um, low, has Melbourne has very lowly dense areas and some very highly dense areas. So we're asking the question is, could we maybe look to increase density in some of our established areas um, around employment centres? Then we consider what assets do we need to build and invest in to increase supply for the growing need of Victoria. Um, and Melbourne um, pre-COVID was growing faster than um, some of the, so many places in the developed world. So that is creating a lot of pressure, particularly um, on some of our transport network. So investment in active transport connections and encouraging the uptake of active transport fits very nicely in our framework um, because it is very much about um, changing behaviour and getting the most out of um, existing assets and some, in some cases building new assets. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of um, the opportunity for active transport in Victoria. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our transport network um, is under pressure. So currently in Melbourne, we are a very car dominated city. So 65% um, so of people, um, according to our 2016 census data, travelled to work in private car. 15.4% took public transport, 4.4% rode a bike or walked. Um, and this breakdown of, was 1.4% of people cycling and 3% work, um, walking and 42 worked at home. So this was obviously um, all pre-COVID. So it will be very interesting to see um, what our next census data shows. So if we continue on our current trajectory, um, Melbourne's uh, transport network and Melbourne as a city is going to be in a little bit of trouble. So this is some of our outputs of our strategic modelling and it shows that under business as usual conditions, much of Melbourne's road network will be congested. Um, and so those, that, those red lines there show congestion on the network, um, on the arterial road and freeway network. Um, 
Uh, it's also expected that Melbourne will, if we continue the way we are, Melbourne will continue to remain a car dependent city. Um, and 86.4% of all trips on the transport network will be um, public, will be private transport trips. So this would lead, this is expected to lead to some really poor outcomes. Worsening congestion with three and a half million trips each day, increased variability um, of travel time, which costs businesses time and time and money and people. Uh, another close to a million extra public transport trips, making um, our public transport services more crowded and less reliable. Fewer people being able to live within 30 minutes of their workplace, making it harder for them to access jobs and services. It's expected that the cost of congestion is going to reach 10.2 billion per year and amenity um, in some areas, some city areas and livability is expected to worsen due to congestion. So that brings me to my next point. What is it that we could do? How could active transport um, help us address some of these issues? So this is a, a photo showing um, Melbourne's roads in peak hour and it looks pretty much like a car park. And um, I think anyone who's ever driven in Melbourne knows that it's in AM peak, it's not a very pleasant experience sometimes, um, particularly in um, inner city areas or in, actually in a lot of areas. <laughs> Um, so, one, so what we did um, in 2018 is um, we did some work to assess the um, potential of um, active transport, um, at the potential number of trips that could be taken up by active transport. So the majority of um, Melbourne's, uh, Melbourne's professional and white collar employment is um, located in the centre of the city. Um, and there is a push um, through um, our planning uh, strategy plan Melbourne um, and uh, through a lot of our plan, a lot of work that um, our planning departments do to encourage um, further economic growth outside of the CBD um, and uh, the growth of employment centres outside of the CBD. And um, seven key sites across the city have been nominated um, as potential places for um, where we could grow professional employment or um, I guess other employment that might be generally be located um, in the central city. Um, and those are shown in this map here um, in orange, which is not the easiest to see, but hopefully it's clear to all of you. Um, the urban form of many of these centres is actually um, quite suburban in nature at the moment. However, the expectation is that as we grow um, over the next 30 years, that the um, these centres will become a, a lot denser and um, I, I guess maybe that the transport network will need to change to service some of these centres. So um, this is a, a graph here that um, we use to map the current um, number of jobs per square kilometre um, in the certain employment centres across Melbourne and then um, the current car mode share. And what you can see is that there is actually a strong um, relationship between um, density and car mode share. So the denser an employment centre, the lower the, um, the car mode share. Um, is. So we sort of identified some um, key employment centres, um, which were many of those seven that I showed you on the previous slide, that um, where a number of trips could be um, shifted to active transport. Um, and so there's, I think, centres that are currently dense um, were selected and centres that are currently um, in the process of um, tra transitioning to denser centres um, and are expected to um, densify over the coming years and decades. So um, this map just highlights um, the centres that we selected um, and this work was done in 2018 as a report as part of a report called um, Five Year Focus which is uh, available to download on our website. Um, so I guess uh, the criteria for selecting trips that could potentially be active transport trips were um, return trips to um, dense 
um, employment, major employment centres, trips in the peak time not currently being taken by AT, trips that are less than 10 kilometres, trips that are taken by those um, younger than 65 and trips that are taken that require, oh, sorry about that, um, people to, um, the trips that don't require people to carry tools to work. Um, so when we did this analysis, we found that there's close to, um, Looking at, two, looking at 2015 trips, there's currently close to 200,000 trips that we believe that could be shifted um, to active transport to some of these key centres. Um, and we made, oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, and we made recommendations um, about um, where, about how this could be done, which is also available um, in that report as well. So, this work is being used to inform some of our upcoming strategy and research work. So we're looking at the we're working at the moment um, to release a draft strategy later this year, which will um, be uh, av av publicly available and we will be consulting um, with the wider community and stakeholders. And then we will, um, I guess, recalibrate and come back in um, and look to refresh that draft and put out a final strategy in mid 2021. So thank you very much everyone um, for your time. Um, hopefully that was an um, insight into how we um, manage transport. Um, oh, we are looking to improve active transport in Victoria. Um, and if you have any queries, um, you can contact us through our website um, and contact details are just available there. Many thanks, Emily, that's, uh, that's great. Um, I'm fortunate to visit uh, Melbourne once or twice a year and uh, it's a wonderful city, but yes, it also has its challenges. I mean, it's, it's um, so such a sprawl city. I'm always amazed how uh, stretched out it is. Uh, um, now, you know, what you kind of your main strategy seems to be <clears throat> to create the seven employment centers or whatever you call them um, and build up employment in these particular areas. I, I wonder, I guess there are many reasons for this, but still it, it concentrates employment in, in certain parts of the city. And I wonder if they've looked at it in spreading employment further throughout the city, not to having to concentrate it in seven areas, but have many or more of the other neighborhoods um, that there will be employment for people. Is, is there any opportunity for that or not? Or is the strategy just to go for the seven centers? Um, I think that's um, something pro that our planning, uh, the Department of Planning does. Um, so our, our role has been to um, look at what they've designated as the strategic sites um, for um, potential mode shift. Um, and so I think we've taken the view that let's start by, I think I often, I always say you have to walk before you can run. So let's start by getting those seven right. Um, and then um, perhaps start to think about um, some of the um, smaller activity centers. And I think, I think we can use, uh, there's a lot of opportunity with um, particularly Monash in um, Melbourne Southeast, which is has the highest concentration of employment outside the CBD. There is a lot of opportunity, I think there, um, and at many of the other NICs as well, um, to encourage, um, to start to uh, encourage mode shift, particularly for those shorter trips. So, so you focus very much on uh, reducing congestion. Um, that seems to be the main focus for increasing active uh, transport. Uh, wouldn't it be better to focus on other aspects like well-being, reducing carbon emissions uh, to increase active transport rather than only on congestion? So um, most of our work is done um, using uh, strategic um, transport models um, and there's information available um, on our website about the models that we use and the analysis that we do. Um, and the limitation of some of these models is that they don't have health variables. However, um, as part of the work that we're doing at the moment, we to refresh the strategy, we are looking at the emissions um, associated with different modes and the benefits um, to the benefits of um, reducing congestion um, 
for the environment. Um, and we also did do some work um, on um, the opportunities for auto auto automated and um, zero emission vehicles, which is also available on our website. <laughs> And uh, how does uh, electric bikes, how do they come in? Because your distances are very large. Do you take, do you give them a special place? I mean, because I mean, uh, you know, it's, as what I said, it's, it's a sprawled city. I mean, the distances, you know, are gigantic at times, I think, and electric bikes would fit in quite well. It's definitely something um, we're starting to look at. Um, so, we're probably uh, in our infancy in um, looking at the opportunity for electric bikes and other forms of micro mobility um, to address some of these transport challenges. Um, so it will be something that we uh, do have a look into as part of our strategy reset refresh. Good. So um, here's a very specific question, I think from someone from Melbourne, because they say Box Hill is not on your list of places of growth, yet it's got huge potential for active transportation um, can, and also for public transportation. Can you say a little bit more about this? So we chose those seven centres um, based on um, the, they're, called, they're known as National Employment and Innovation Clusters, and they were set out, um, they're set out in um, Plan Melbourne, which um, sets out, is a Melbourne's long-term um, planning document that um, the Department of um, Plan, uh, Department of Environment, Land, uh, I always, I always mouth mouthful, Department of Environment, Land Use, DELP, DELP, <laughs> um, do, yeah, use. Okay. Um, if there have been, uh, did you investigate further opportunities for cycling to train stations, uh, particular for addressing long distance travel? Um, so as part of this five year focus work, we focused um, primarily um, on those seven centers, which uh, touches on that point of you have to walk before you can run. Um, but we are looking um, as part of our strategy refresh into the potential of um, what active transport trips can do for um, train stations um, and how Many thanks that, uh, and I'm looking forward to going back to, um, to, to, to Melbourne again. Um, we would finish, I would like to finish with your questioning. I just got a, a couple of questions for all of for the speakers as such. I mean, because um, one of the things comes up uh, regularly is the CO2 emissions uh, issue, I mean, for reducing CO2. Uh, and perhaps I can start with you, Emily. How is Melbourne addressing this? I mean, how are you taking this into account for, uh, um, for your policies? Um, so we are an independent body, so we provide advice to government. So that um, through our work on um, autonomous, Auto automated and zero emission vehicles. Um, we provided advice on to government um, on what it is that they could do to um, adopt uh, to encourage um, lower emission vehicles. Um, so um, that's definitely something that we've um, developed a lot of work on. Um, and again, that's available on our website if um, anyone wants some further information. Thank you. The, um, I would like to go back to Bert. Bert, are you online still? Because um, Bert set out kind of a framework for, um, you know, how to look at active travel in particular, the, the benefits and, and, and risks, etc. Looking at the other presentations, Bert, I mean, can you comment a little bit on, the, on them? Uh, how they fit within your network, uh, within your framework? Uh, I have to admit that I spent most of the time answering questions and not listening to the presentations after my presentation. But yes, uh, in an overall framework like a multi-criteria analysis or a cost-benefit analysis, you should include all relevant effects. Um, and in the case of a CDA, in monetary terms. That is not as easy as it might seem. I wrote a paper on how to do an adequate cost-benefit analysis for cycling policies together with Maria Buryasson in 2015, and we see many pitfalls. People easily can come to wrong estimates. Um, coming back to the point of CO2 specifically, in most studies, the monetary value of the CO2 emission changes are small compared to the health benefits of active modes. 
And the reason is that we value CO2 currently in the order of magnitude of 50 to 75 or 100 euros per ton. And that for some people, they say it's an overestimation. Others say, if we really want to go to the 1.5 degree uh, maximum uh, temperature increase, we need to implement uh, policies that are way more costly. So we should uh, include way higher price tags compared to the 75 euros per ton. And that would make CO2 emissions way more important than the overall evaluation. Uh, but any other issues, Mark, that you want me to reflect upon with respect to the assessment? Um, no, at the moment not. Uh, perhaps, Joe, I mean, if you're still there, um, perhaps you can comment on some of the issues what you heard in other places around uh, collisions and injuries. Um, you've seen some of the other, I, mean, I come back to it because it's, it's an important issue, I think. A lot of, you know, active transport users don't feel safe often. And I, I want to come back to this, what you've seen from the other presentations. Uh, anything that you picked up on that you would think uh, that's important to pay attention to? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think I think that really is the point that comes from Bert as well. Is that and uh, it's really interesting to see that matrix actually of kind of relationships because you know the key barrier is safety, both in terms of absolute safety, absolute numbers, measured risk, but also perceptions of safety, how people feel, how people perceive safety in their place and that's quite a difficult thing to sometimes understand and there's this whole range of kind of human factors and different behaviors that vary by different cohorts etc that we really need to understand you know in London we have a lot of people cycling who are uh, probably a little bit younger than me um, are probably even slightly higher incomes than me who um, are, and are white males and I think one thing we've seen in the crisis recently is that is perhaps you know there is a really big untapped potential here a near market to, to, to kind of extend that a little bit. So I think, yeah, certainly learned, learned a lot there in terms of, of some of the thinking at a global level. And I think the reality is that other cities are further progressed here. And I think one of the challenges that some of those cities are facing from a safety perspective is the e-mobility challenge, uh, electric bicycles, the larger bicycle or higher kinetic energy, et cetera. So there are, there are safety challenges, but as, as well as opportunities here. Excellent, many thanks. Dad. So we're going to round off this session. Um, I would like to remind you that we're going to have now a short break of about 10, 15 minutes until 10.42, I think. It's well time to the minute. Um, make yourself a coffee or a tea. Um, then uh, Balen will get back uh, with four excellent speakers. Um, what we're going to see now, I think. You can have a look. I also would like to remind you that if you want to attend the, the webinar this afternoon, uh, please uh, register. Make sure you're registered because it's not the same link as this one. And the afternoon, this is European time afternoon. And um, also that if you have any further questions, please put them on the question and answer session. We will ask the speakers to answer the questions that we will post them on the web so you can see uh, what are the responses and what can be done. Um, and uh, finally, again, I would like to, to thank um, our people behind the screens that you don't see at the moment, what are particular Laura Hidalgo, who has been uh, putting this all together uh, with help of Annie, Sasha, Aless and Albert here. Um, we're doing a great job. We haven't had any crashes uh, and I hope that we can continue. So now there's going to be a break of, I think, 14 minutes as far I can think of. And we hope to see you back soon. So this will be the same link as this one. So you can just stay on and uh, make yourself a cup of tea. Thanks so much. Thank uh you. -huh.